Hey, welcome to episode 29 of the Reluctant Leader Podcast with Paul Jenkins. Um, that's me. I'm Paul Jenkins. And we are one episode away from the big 3-0. Man, I can't believe it. This has been such an incredible journey. And today, I'm going to be playing for you uh, an interview that I recorded a couple weeks ago with Robbie Angle. He is an incredible leader, and our conversation just went in places and directions I never expected that it would. Um, We talk about maybe one of the best books that I've ever read and that he's ever read, and we talk a lot about why it's so futile to try to please God, why we keep doing more and more and more for Him and finding ourselves less and less satisfied I think that this is going to be one of those episodes that you're going to want to listen to over and over again. It's really going to give you some insight and set you free. So if you're ready, y'all, let's jump into my interview with Robbie Angle. Hey, listen, we're so glad to have Robbie Angle with us on this episode of the Reluctant Leader Podcast. Um, Robbie, I'm going to introduce you and it's going to sound like I've known you forever, but we literally just met about um, five minutes ago. Um, and when I, when I went to learn who you were, I, I just, and I just told Robbie this before we started recording, uh, it just blows me away how God opens doors for me to talk to people like you. Um, Robbie, what is the president now and CEO of a ministry called True Face? Um, he was prior to that served for seven years at North Point Community Church as the director of adult ministry environments and director of men's groups. That's a mouthful. But let me just say this, he's a regular dude uh, that just loves Jesus and loves to see people grow. Um, What was drawn, what I was drawn to as I was reading your bio was just authenticity and um, honesty, being known, overcoming shame, these kind of topics. And so I'm just going to give you a second to introduce yourself however you would want to, because I just gave all that official introduction. But, you know, you just kind of fill in the gaps and tell us what you're into, what you love. I know you've got eight, eight children. Is that right? Yeah. 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 I've got eight kids in eight years, so I have no time, no money, no energy. And, uh, I, yeah, I love Jesus. I have been on an adventure of trusting him and it's been really fun. And I wake up every day wanting to go back to earning, striving, deserving, because I'm a firstborn high drive, high achiever, eight Enneagram, all that. And so every day I get his grace anew of the reminders of like, no, he loves me just as I am. And he likes me and there's nothing more I can do more or less to, to deserve that love. He's, he is good with me. And and I've spent the past 25, it's like a part-time job, uh, every day, um, trying to move from pride, which as I can, you know, do more, be better, all that stuff for God into humility of like, no, nah, I can't. He did. I just get to receive it. And that is the good. Um, some days are better than others. Today's pretty good um, of just gratitude and going, man, this is a light yoke of just trusting you and and one day at a time with what you bring. Yeah. Yeah. This, we're recording this on a Friday, which is why this is a good day. This is probably why I don't record on Monday. <laughs> that's right. That's I, just right. as you're saying that, I keep thinking like, that's such a simple message of what Jesus does through salvation. Like we know it's his work. We know it's not our work, but, and I've been pastoring for a number of years now. It just seems like that's a consistent message that we forget. And I, why, wh- why do you think that is? What? Cause it's, because it's easier for me to try to earn his love. I think it all like, to me, it's so simple and I'm spending my whole life trying to understand the complexity of it that like, all right, so God made us for relationships. Sin breaks relationships. So we have this broken relationship with God. So what my pride, which as I can do says, I want to like make right what is broken. So that means knowledge plus behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Sinless do more for God and I'll make right what was broken. Well, that's like most of the Christian world that we live in. And it's like not biblical. And, you know, the truth is he's going, no, you can't make better. What is broken of more knowledge, better behavior. I did. That's the essence of the gospel. And so maturing into that discipleship, following me, 
It is a matter of receiving who you already are as a son, as a saint. And, and that is like so hard to do every day to receive that I can't do anything to make right. He did. Right. It's easier for me to earn than it is receive. It's easier for me to strive than it is to trust. And that's where like, if I could get it, I'd miss out on that surrendered receiving of his love every day again. And he loves me too much even to let that happen. So, um, I, I learned that the hard way. I was a missionary in Northern Pakistan, Al Qaeda territory. And like wow. in Oh five, after the earthquake with Samaritan's purse. So I was like killing it as a Christian Sunday school teachers were like, this guy's awesome because like, you know, all of us think like Sunday school teachers, it's like, if you really love Jesus, you're going to be like Andy Stanley or Billy Graham or like yeah. a missionary in Africa. Yeah. Well, I was like ahead of schedule in Al Qaeda territory, mm -hmm. but inside it was like the, the motives, the pride, I was so disoriented and my father, God loves me so much. And he's like, I know the depths of your pride and I know you had to go learn and be an extreme Christian to realize the depths of your pride of, of how I, my motive is to earn it, you know, yeah. um, and not receive it. And that's how I missed out on grace and, and the gospel. And there, there's a quote in the cure, which is the signature teaching. It's a book which captures the signature teaching of true face. And it says, do we see ourselves as sinners striving to be a saint or do we see ourselves as saints who occasionally sin? And that paradigm shift in theology, I've spent most of most of my life trying to shift into a more healthy theology and identity of of sainthood, of new creation, of Christ yeah. in me, of of righteousness. Yeah. And I'm I'm guessing that most people would say the first, but we want them to say the second. Right. And we, I keep, it's your talk. I'm thinking about is it the first or second chapter of Galatians where Paul says, like, hey, y'all, you started you so Galatians. well. What yeah. are you doing now? Like, I think he uses the word bewitched in the King James. And, I, but like, who's basically who's cast a spell on you to make you think that now you can somehow earn from God what he so graciously gave you? And just in the American church, and I guess I, I tell my church all the time, that's the only context I have. I'm in America, in the in American church that man we can do it mentality is great if you're doing like a project to feed the city but if we take pride in that like yeah. we got the job done and that earns us favor with god yeah then we've missed the whole fact that we he loved us when we were his enemies which is also right. what paul said you know That's so right. i i, I I, you've got one of these questions I want to ask you is like, how do we live in authentic community with others? I think part of that's going to be, well, admitting what we just talked about. Like, yeah, yeah. That, that is a key component because if I see myself through a lens of, sh of earning, you know, mm -hmm. then I see myself through a lens of shame, which says you screw up. Guilt says you screwed up. Shame says you're a screw up. If I see myself as a sinner and therefore as a screw up, then I have to wear a mask and pose to you and people around me because you will affirm what I believe about myself that I'm a sinner and I see myself through shame. Now, when we see ourselves as righteous sons and daughters of the king, loved and liked by the father, that is a position of security that yeah. allows us to move into vulnerability. And so you can know the worst of me because my security and my identity is secure. And so you can know all of me and know my struggles, weaknesses, because I'm, um, I'm secure in my identity through seeing myself the way Jesus sees me, which is a saint made right. new righteous and parted with him. So yes, our identity theology, um, is how we see God is the greatest indicator of how we see ourselves, hmm. how we treat others is often an indicator of how we treat, treat, see ourselves. Our view of God, self and others are interconnected. Mm -hmm. Jesus knew this and said, this is it. The summation, love God, love others. <laughs> right, right. There's the interconnectedness. Like if I see God as a disappointed dad with a clipboard waiting for me to learn more, sin less, then I see myself as a failure through a lens of shame. If I see him as a loving father who made right our relationship, like in the parable of the, 
uh, the prodigal son. He's waiting and he's like, ah, I love you. Welcome. Yeah. And I see myself through a lens of grace and security. And therefore I treat others with that openness and not judgmental, the interconnectedness we cannot shake. So with a foundation of a healthy theology identity, then upon that, we can build relationships, communities, uh, where we're known in order to be loved, where we're, where, where we can, where we can be the body of Christ and love each other. Yeah. You know, I, I keep thinking about as you're talking as from a pastor filter, if my view of God is the angry God with a clipboard, like waiting for me to mess up, then when I'm preaching and teaching, I'm teaching people that I also think are screw ups. Yeah. I mean, it's such an unhealthy, toxic, and I, we're in a series right now at our church. I feel like I'm repenting every week for things. I, I don't even know if I even realized I saw the world that way, but it's like, I don't want to go back to like, no, we don't, we can't earn this. And then the balance of that, and I'd be interested to kind of get your input on this would be, so we take a deep breath and we expose who we are. Like we, you know, you, the true face, you know, you, we we take the mask down and this is who I really am. Talk to me first for a little bit about navigating the emotions of I expose myself to God and he loves me, but then I've also been vulnerable with people and they maybe didn't or yeah. didn't know what to do with that level of vulnerability. What, what does somebody do in that situation? Yeah, I think you're honoring the reality that it takes courage to be vulnerable. And there is a risk because in vulnerability, if I trust you with the real me and you reject that, that's hurt. That hurts. Right. Um, and a lot of us have been hurt deeply in the past. And therefore we keep people at a distance because the opportunity cost, the pros, the cons of of trusting that deeply um, isn't worth it to us because the pain outweighs the perceived benefit. Right. And we're walking around because of that low grade, disconnected, isolated, and we're longing because it's innately designed in us to long for intimacy, to be seen, to be sued, to be safe, secure, to be known in order to be loved. Like that mm -hmm. is what all of us long for like with our, with our spouses, with our kids, with each other, with our close friends. And, and, and we, we, we don't know how to break through. We don't know how to experience intimacy because of those fears. And so uh, just to encourage whoever's listening, we're all walking around longing for a close friend who we can do life with. Mm -hmm. And we're all waiting for that person to have the courage to in vulnerability step out and be known and love us and ask us questions we're all waiting for somebody to be the friend we want right. and we're all walking around isolated and lonely so to have the courage to be the one to reach out which takes vulnerability um that's a gift to most everybody whether mm -hmm. they know it or not and to my best friend Benj it was like eight years ago where he just started reaching out and texting me every week. He put it on his calendar. We had one coffee. Then he put it on his calendar to text me every week a question. And mm. that's risky. He's like, hey, let's be friends without saying it as a right, grown up. Right. Yeah. And if I ignored him, that hurts. It's an yeah. abandonment thing that, you know, um, but it's result. I was looking for somebody with that intentionality and proactivity and now we're besties. And so, yeah. uh, it takes courage and there's a risk, but we're, aren't we tired of missing out of the potential joy of that connection? I mean, I know I am. Yeah. I was reading uh, in Psalms this past week. I think it, it's Psalm 109. And it's like one of those Psalms where David is like, oh God, these people are attacking me. And just would you do me a favor and wipe them off the planet? Um, but it, I, I stopped after the, I think it's after the fourth verse. The first three verses, he's just like, people are, they, don't, they, I'm loving them and they're returning hate for my love and they're accusing yeah. me and it's false and none of it's true. And then he just makes this simple statement, but I am a man of prayer. And I was like, huh? Like I wouldn't have responded that way. I would have been, 
like, you know, oh, you, you said this about me on Facebook. I'm going to say the same thing or worse about you. And, um, we get in this back and forth thing, but it was, it's all like, like David said, all of this is external and it hurts, but I'm a man of prayer. I'm going to take it to my father. I'm going to let him remind me of who I am and I'm not going to respond to you the way you're responding to me. Um, that, that internal emotional health I'm finding is so important and yeah. we haven't talked about it enough in church. And it seems like to me, church hurt is more hurt than worldly hurt. I mean, we expect so much from people in church and then they let us down. We get to, we let them down. There's so much angst and hurt in church. And if we don't talk about it, no one's going to be healed and we're just going to walk around bleeding on each other and not even know yep. why. So I'm so thankful for, you know, ministries like what you have with true face and just your intentionality, which is what I take from the, the friend who said, I'm going to text you a question every week. I and mean, he was intentional about it, whether you responded or not. That's and right. I think it, it probably takes that. And, and cause it's hard. And what, what you're alluding to in regards to our health being our wounds, our healing being interconnected, it, it's that chicken egg deal where if we're aware of our wounds and our trauma from our past that's put up the walls, then we move into relationship. However, as we move into relationship, that is the objective catalyst in a safe environment for us to then process our wounds. You know, so it's a it's a both and process. And this is what formation is about. And you know, we our signature tool, Trueface develops grace-based relational discipleship resources to serve the church. And our signature offering is a nine-month group uh, discipleship process. And the first few months, you build a foundation of trust. And during that time, you look back at family of origin stuff, genogram stuff. Like you say, this is why I don't trust God and why I don't trust mm. others. Before moving into, okay, do I have the right view of God and the right view of myself in order to trust him? And if he's a loving God, I can trust understanding why I haven't trusted him by looking backwards. Then I can say, okay, what does it look like to get, trust God in my relationships with my time, talents, treasures? And so a lot of times we start on our actions and knowledge mm -hmm. and we don't honor people by like the healing process and the evaluation of view of God and self, but that's for another podcast. It, However, we cannot do any of that stuff in isolation. And a lot of our churches rely on formation discipleship happening in 60 minutes where we teach at people. And it's like, no, no, no. As, as, as you know, and I know, Paul, like the church is the body of Christ. The process of discipleship is through those relationships. And that's going to happen. The, the church is the gathering and the conduit to help us connect on deeper right. levels with a few people in order to process these, these views of God, views of self, these healings on a deeper level. And, you know, there's a Dunbar, he's a, he's not a Christian, but he was like a psychiatrist. And he said, you know, he studied human dynamics and he said, you really, you can have five loved ones. The average person can have a capacity of five deeply loved ones, 15 close friends, 50 friends. And when you look at Jesus, it's like, oh yeah, he had his three, his 12, his mm -hmm. 70. Like um, the kingdom work happens not in the 150 or the 500, but in the fives and the 15s. And each of us in those environments, those are small groups, life groups. That's the body of Christ. That's gathering together as believers to help remind each other of truths, protect each other's weaknesses. And any of us can have the courage to take a step in vulnerability and intentionality to build those relationships on a deeper level as we all are on this journey of following Jesus. Yeah. And it's, it's so, that's so challenging though. You know, it's like, that's so far removed from, I'm just going to show up at church, give you a couple of dollars and you give me a really good sermon and we'll go home, which is kind of what a lot of us know yeah um, and and again i'm not saying that anybody doing church like that the people that are actually communicating the gospel i mean they might have their whole heart in it but it's not a one-way street there's i mean we're the body of christ like if my arm stops working my body's not functioning 
Yep. And we got to know each other. That relationship is so, so critical. Um, talk, talk a little bit about shame if you've got time. Um, I don't want to keep you longer than you can stay on. Um, I appreciate your time with us. But we, I guess because I'm doing this series at our church dealing with fear, shame, and manipulation, I feel like everywhere I turn, I see it, you know, because it's what yeah. I'm studying right now. But, man, shame plays such a, it's such a tactic of the enemy to keep us hidden um, yeah. what, what do you, what do you see about that? How can we live free from that? And at the same time, develop these close relationships where we often experience that shame. Yeah. I, I, I love that question because it is interconnected. Our shame is connected to our view of God because it's an ident it's a response to our identity, how we see ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we work out our identity in the context of others because they have the objectivity to tell us when we're you know, in lies were in truth. So I like to think of shame simply as um, guilt says you failed. Shame says you're a failure. Right. Guilt says you screwed up. Shame says you're a screw up. Shame is, is an identity statement. And if we see ourselves as sinners, then shame is a right response of I'm a screw up. I screwed up. I broke relationship with the God who created me, who designed right. me for a relationship of love. Now, the more we trust the truths of how God sees us, which is as an imparted with his righteousness as saints, as adopted, redeemed, justified sons and daughters of the king, then, then we've got to wrestle with the question, did Jesus die for our sin and our shame? Because he died for our sin and he gave a new identity in relation to our creator as a saint. So he took care of our shame. He has replaced it with a new identity. So it's a temporary fix to try to, to try to fix our, like reframe positively and see myself, you know, as if, through a shame-free lens mm -hmm. without that theology piece connected to it for real transformation. Yeah. And so I, I think the lie is um, we need to do more sin less to be right with God. Mm -hmm. And that is what shame echoes. Shame echoes the lie. And it's hard, like if we if we deal with a lie without replacing it with the truth, it comes back. Right. And so dealing with that lie of that we're we're screw ups, he's going, no, we have to replace it with the truth and go, God, how do let me believe and receive how you see me as your son who is redeemed, who is who is righteous. And when we we've got to replace the lies with truth. And it's in community that we get to remind each other of the truth when right. we start believing the lie of shame. Yeah. So would you say that that's, that's the reason why if I've had a really good week with Jesus, I read my Bible every day, or I, I did that reading panel, new version. Those are the Sundays I can't wait to go to church. But if I've had a really hard week, I tend to want to stay away. Is is that the value of community that, hey, even on your worst day, you're still valued and loved here? Yeah, and I, I think that's a subtle lie, too, because that's even underpinning of like, but because most of my life, it's like, yeah, if I read the Bible, if I'm praying more, if I'm serving more or whatever, um, then I got to be cooler with God, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's like, I was a missionary in Northern Pakistan. I was a mess, but I was killing it on all those things. Right. So I, I don't know if that's connected to shame as much as like, that's more of um, like, I don't feel like I deserve church. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I think that is from the lie of like, still the lie that doing more being better makes me cool with God. So I feel better about myself, but we mm -hmm. know that's temporary because tomorrow we're going to stop doing that. And we go back into shame. And so that's like a band aid over shame. Like yeah. a lot of us, a lot of us use religion, read, pray, do more, give more, serve more as a band aid to feel better about our shame, but it mm -hmm. doesn't address the root cause of, that that's just a, a I'm just performing my way out of feeling into feeling better. Yeah. But like th that's why it's so hard. So I think the community piece, which you just said, it's so hard to get to the the motive of the heart. Right. To change your view of God and self. 
that 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 is so hard to do subjectively that I need you as a brother for us to process this together and wrestle with with the subtleties of motive, theology, identity. Yeah. Yeah. There's it's it is all well connected. <laughs> no, I mean pun intended, right? Um one one of those revelation revelatory verses from my wife and I, I'd love your your just your take on this, is um in Matthew seven when Jesus like these people say, Hey, didn't we do all these things for you? And there are things that some things I haven't even done, right? Like I'm a pastor. I, I don't know if I've done all those things, but they're, they're good things. And he calls them workers of iniquity. Like he calls the good thing they did bad. And the reason he did it was because he said, I never knew you. Yeah. And it suddenly dawned on my wife and I, wait a second. Like he didn't say, because you never knew me. Like we learn a lot about Jesus at church, but he's like, but I never knew you. Yes. And that, that whole like being known is a big deal in the body of Christ. Yeah. And he already knows us. I mean, he, but we don't, but it's receiving. And that's the difference you're talking about, which I love it. There's a statement that truth informs. We know plenty about God in our head that informs but trusted truth transforms. Mm. So most of us as Christians are stuck in our head knowing plenty about God. That's not the problem. We, we've been doing the church thing for 20 years, but then we read about peace and freedom and r- really experiencing his love. And we're like, no way, I don't know anything about that. Right. And so that's because we know truth, but we're not trusting truth. Trust is a relational application of truth, which means in my vertical relationship with God, Trusting God doesn't mean knowing about his love. It means receiving it, letting him love me. Trust trust just means to let him redeem me, forgive me, like to let him love me. And with others, trust is a relational word where we practice out that faith of letting you meet my needs, see me. That's why vulnerability is a, a catalyst of of experiencing love because it helps us let each other, which means trust, love us. And it, I love how he said later of like, um, uh, uh, your faith. What, what is the verse that says like, um, Jesus is pleased with us. It's our faith that pleases him. Mm -hmm. Um, it, which is trusting him that that is what please not doing, not knowing, but letting him receiving, trusting his love for us that we get to experience what he did for us, which is that that's the beautiful dance of grace yeah. where it has nothing to do with earning. It has to do with receiving. I mean, that, that is rich. That's really, really deep. Um, and we get to practice this and remind each other every day, right. which is his grace is a new every day, like manna, because right. every day I want to wake up earning it because yeah. I'm want to be in control like all of us do. So this is the gift of this. We, we get it and remind each other every day and practice every day. It's it takes a lifetime for us to build that trust muscle and, and re- practice it a little well, bit better. Well, and it, and it's a it's a total shift. Like it totally shifts the way I read scriptures that I have read my entire life. Oh yeah. And I'll I'll just say this and then let you respond and then you can kind of tell our listeners how to get in touch with you. Um, we so appreciate your time. All my life, I've read that part about. Peter denying Jesus and then the rooster crows and Jesus looks at him. And I've always pictured it as Jesus, like glaring, like when staring a, a, just into the soul of Peter, like he's angry. And it dawned on me a couple of years ago, like we're wired to attach emotion to sound and memory to sound. And why would Jesus attach mm. Peter's worst moment to a sound he would hear every morning? And it was because he didn't attach his worst moment to that. He attached the the grace in his eyes to that moment. Like in your worst moment, I still saw you. I still loved you. I still went to the cross for you. And every morning when you hear that rooster crow, I want you to remember that my mercy is new again. It's like, holy cow. That's awesome. If, If God is a clipboard holding God who's mad at us, you'll never read scripture that way. Yep. In and I always felt like the Peter who needed to be reminded every day that I was a worm and awful and I'll never be enough. But it's like, he flips it and says, wait a second. Like, yeah, I knew all of that already, but you're still my son. 
I still want you. So I, I, again, I I appreciate the ministry that you have. Um, I am definitely going to be getting the cure. I'm going to be looking into that nine month journey. Um, it sounds like you guys are doing some phenomenal things. Um, so would you just take a moment and let our listeners know where they can find more about you, maybe get some of those resources and um, just stay connected and we'll put all this in the show notes as well. Thanks, man. You, we have a podcast, the True Face podcast. You can go to trueface.org. You can download the True Face Life app, um, where it's a lot of these resources are free. Um, and yeah, we exist to serve the church and serve you experiencing the type of relation to experience these th- these relationships that we're longing for. So our, our last tool that came out this week uh, is, is a true face conversation called breaking your cycle. Hmm. And we partnered with Michael Cusick from restoring the soul to build a tool to help people walk with somebody through great through, through an addiction. Because the problem is I tell you, I'm looking at porn and we go, what do we do? Hey, have you read this book? And you call a week later and go, Hey, how you doing with that? Or drinking or whatever that habit is. Hmm. And when we go to accountability, which focuses on the sin, it's sin management, behavior modification right. doesn't work. That's right. the cop approach to accountability where we need a cardiologist, somebody to walk with us, mm. unearth the heart issues leading to those behaviors. And we don't know how to do that. So that's an example of one of the tools that we made for people so that they could go, hey, thanks for sharing that with me. Do you want to do these six conversations? And a conversation is you watch a 10 minute video and you at, and we provide you the four questions to process. Wow. So that so that when Paul calls me next week and says, um, meth, you know, is his new thing, I'm like, hey, Paul, <laughs> instead of checking in, <laughs> hey, you want to do this uh breaking your cycle, six yeah. conversations, and we walk together. So I'm like, hey, we can walk through our own stuff. Um, have you ever had anybody wrap up a podcast with alluding to maybe like an addiction? I I don't think I've ever, and this is my, this is our 29th episode. This will be our 29th episode. Yeah. We're almost at 30. And this is the first time I've had somebody mention porn and meth while also telling people where to stay connected with them. Let's go. Let's go. Well, you are making the reluctant leader podcast history right now. And I will probably easily double my listenership just based on that alone hey so, we, uh, n- next one we'll take it to the next level in freedom of our identity because we are love saints right come on that's it man thank you so much for spending some time with us <laughs> and, Thanks, we'll, and we'll have you we'll have you back on again I'd, I'd love to continue the conversation you know catch up maybe a little bit later and see what's going on with true face and you and um again thanks for spending time with us Thanks for serving the local church, Paul, and let us know how we can serve you. See ya. Absolutely. See ya. Wasn't that amazing? Man, I told you it was going to be a good interview. Robbie just dropped some wisdom, and I know that you're encouraged by it. I think you'll want to listen to this over and over again. If you found value in it, maybe you know somebody who would also be encouraged. Why not just share this episode or even share the podcast with them? Please like and subscribe it. So you can be notified. We, we try to do new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Um, I am the reluctant leader. And if you're like me, sometimes we're just not sure if we have what it takes. And so I love these conversations that encourage me and encourage you in our leadership. Um, here's what we say all the time. You, you know, you might be hesitant. You might be reluctant, but keep saying yes. And God will do the rest. I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of the day and we'll see you here the next time we drop episode 30.